In the Gospel accounts, and I believe especially in the book of John, there is a conflict taking place between the leadership of the religious establishment and Jesus. And so we see in one passage where Jesus says, you're of your father, the devil. And so I want to take a look at just that one passage and some of the understandings that we can get from that that are probably not so conventional. So one of the things I pointed out before is that I think there's a reference being made to Moses in saying he was a murderer from the beginning because Moses slew an Egyptian and Jesus had said that there's one accuse there's one who accuses you which is Moses. And so I think there's a tie in there between the idea of the law of Moses being a tool of accusation. And really the law principle in general is a tool of accusation. And I've discussed how the law principle is that you have rules. And then these rules are enforced by a promise of reward and a threat of punishment. And these rules are crafted because they are contrary to the intents of the heart that a person has. And so then there's this coercion in order to get that person to behave in a way that is contrary to his intent. So for example, if you have someone who is afraid to cheat on their spouse, because of the rule in place, the law, that is going to create a negative consequence for doing so, then what you have is a person who, whose intent is that he wants to cheat on his spouse. But this law principle is working contrary to the intent. And by contrast, you could have somebody who is so thoroughly and completely enamored with his spouse that the idea of being with anyone else for any reason and in any way or fashion is incomprehensible. It's nonsensical. It's silly. It's ridiculous. And so what you have then is that there's no force needed to act contrary to the intent because the intent is in harmony with the principle of love one another. So law is always an attempt to act contrary to a person's intent, which means that it's a tool of accusation because then what you have are rules where people don't actually want to follow and you're attempting to create a coercive measure either through promise of reward or most notably through threat of punishment to cause a person to act contrary to their intent. So that's the law principle. Specifically here we have the law of Moses which is a severe punitive and comprehensive law principle. So when it came to the law of Moses this wasn't merely rules with promises of rewards and threats of punishment. This was the law taken basically as far as it goes, where violation of that law resulted in either being sent away from the city, you, you became exiled, or you were killed. So if we take a look at the Old Testament, what we see is a law principle enforced by the most severe punitive measures possible exile, and death. One thing we can interpret from this is that if this was an effective means of producing a functional society, they would have had a highly functional society. But what they didn't have was a functional society. Instead, they had a society that treated those in need as though they were in need because God hated them and treated those who prospered as though they were prosperous 
because they were the ones chosen of God. They had a society that placed adherence to the rules above the well-being of the individual. And so what you see and the lesson that can be learned from what we see in the Law of Moses is that it was non-functional. It didn't do what it allegedly was supposed to do. It didn't accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish. It did not create harmony. It did not create a functional society. It created a hateful, cruel, callous, bloodthirsty, hateful, divisive society. And so that's something to just even think about from time to time. Thinking that what we need is more severe enforcement, more severe punitive measures. Because in the Law of Moses, exile and death were the punitive measures and did not create an idealized society. So we have Jesus confronting the religious establishment. And he says here in John, I believe it's 8, yes, 844. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so I think there's a reference here with he was a murderer from the beginning to Exodus 2.12, and he looked this way and that, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. But I want to take a look because one of the things is the principle of lost in translation. And so one thing to understand about all the biblical text is that everything has more meaning to it as it was expressed in the original language than what we get in the translation. So I've pointed out, for example, that you get a word play between Adam and Adama, meaning Adam, man and dirt. And so there's this wordplay between the earth and Adam. And then we take it even one step further and think there's a guy named Adam. Like that's who he he's oh that's Adam. But Adam means man. So we've got these idea this idea of a of a person and that's his name. Whereas the original text would have understood the expression of it would have been the same as if I, if I had named somebody in my story Hope and Faith. You know, if I had characters named Hope and a character named Faith and a character named Prudence, you would understand that I'm telling you something about the characters, that their names are expressions of who they are. And we lose this in the translation. So, for example, when we see the story of Jacob... We think there's a guy named Jacob, but what they're reading, the, the original text is telling you there's a guy who's a swindler. His name is, his name is heel grabbing, two timing, deceitful swindler, no good Nick. That's his name. And so every time it says Jacob in the original text, you would have understood we're talking about a guy who's a swindler. He, you could have named him criminal. You could have named them felon in, in modern English. So here's the story of felon. Here's the story of liar. Here's the crooked, here's the story of crooked swindler. You know, put that in there. Every time you see Jacob, put crooked swindler. And so their understanding in the original text, this is the story of crooked swindler. This is the story of two time and cheater. This is the story of don't believe a word he says because he's trying to steal something from you. And so we think it's a guy named Jacob. It's not a guy named Jacob. It's a guy who the story is telling you is 
completely a cheat. And so then he has his name changed to Israel. And so his name is changed to wrestles with God and wins. So he goes from being crooked swindler, cheater, liar that you can't trust worth a damn to wrestled with God and won. So these are the kinds of things that we don't translate because we've transliterated the names. We've taken the sound, we've taken our version of a name and translated it transliterated it to English rather than taking the meaning of the name and translating it into English. So we don't read a story of crooked swindler. We read a story of Jacob when we should be reading a story of crooked swindler. We should be reading a story of salvation, but instead we're reading a story of Jesus. So in the Old Testament, you have a person whose name is salvation. And this person named salvation is a brutal, violent military leader who kills everybody and they move in. And so then in the New Testament, you have a guy whose name is Salvation and he harms no one. He's the complete opposite. And when Peter pulls a sword and thinks, finally we get to fight. Finally our deliverer is going to act like the military leader that our deliverer is supposed to be. He says, put your sword away which I think is actually why Peter denied him three times. I think he was pissed off. I think he was thinking, what the hell? When are we going to fight? I finally get the chance to fight and you're telling me no? So it completely inverted the idea of salvation from the Old Testament idea of military conquest to the New Testament idea of love one another. Of, serv- of, of rule by service, not by lordship. And so, this happens with so many words. And so, for example, the word spirit is also the same word as the word breath. And when going through things, there's all different kinds of additional meanings to the words that would have been there in the original context and the original rendering of it in the language that it was written in. So that's a very long way to get to the point that our understanding of the word father is dad. He's the guy who raised me or the guy who did whatever and then abandoned my mother, you know, or, or whatever. We, we think of the biological human being that contributed genetically to one half of your biological material. So, just to kind of frame it, that we think of father in that kind of term, and Jesus did use that illustration of father, where he said, like, your father is good to you, uh, so how much better is your father in heaven going to be good to you? Um, But they would have understood more meaning to the word that they were using as father. Whereas father means source and point of origin. Um, It means Genesis. So the book of Genesis is called Genesis because the first words of it are in the beginning. And so in the beginning is, is what the word Genesis means. So the book is actually just called in the beginning. Um, And so that got turned into what we now call in English Genesis, but that was derived from a translation of, of the first words being translated to Genesis. And then we just kept the word Genesis. Um, And so the word father means an origin and a source and the word origin means the beginning or it also means arising. So the Orient, the, you know, land to the east, the Oriental land, it's called the Orient because Orient means rising. So the sun rises in the east, the sun rises in the Orient. And so Orient is the beginning and the rising. So they would have understood when all these times when we put the word father, also put in your, in your mind, 
the substitution that the word father means origin. It means source. So it just doesn't, it doesn't mean biologically contributing daddy. So that's the kind of the problem we get into here because then there's some doctrines that are derived from this idea that you have an actual, like a biological progenitor, the devil. And then you've got the devil who's a supernatural spirit being rival to God who runs around trying to trick people out of worshiping God the right way or something, whatever. But again, devil means accusation. Devil means accuser. Devil means slanderer. And so that would not have been, we, that would not have been separated from the word there. So father and origin and beginning would not be separate ideas and devil and slander and accusation would not be separate ideas. So then when we look at this verse, Jesus is saying, you're of your origin, the accuser and the lust of your origin, you will do. So the lust, the lust is going to be those things which derive. So your origin is accusation and the things that arise <clears throat> the things that arise out of accusation is what you'll do. Okay, so now let's take the personification of accusation as a he. Let's just put the word about accusation back in there instead of he. So it says, accusation was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in accusation. There is no truth in accusation. This is what Jesus is contesting, that when your source is accusation, there's no truth in accusation. This is the part that gets really good. When accusation speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. For accusation is a liar and the origin of it. Okay, so now... Let's think about this. What Jesus is taking this one step further. When accusation speaks a lie, which is the only thing accusation speaks, because there's no truth in accusation. So if it's an accusation, it's false, which is the definition of slander. It's a false accusation. That's what devil means, false accusation. He's saying accusation is false. When accusation speaks, this is personifying. So if I, if I cast forth an accusation at you or at myself, then that's a lie. Okay. Now when accusation speaks, accusation speaks of his own. Here's what this means. This means that whatever accusation is being put forth is actually telling you about the accuser, not the person being accused. Whatever the accusation is, is telling you who the accuser is, not who the accused is. This is interesting because this is the same chapter that they brought to him, a woman caught in adultery. And it says that they tempted him that they might have to accuse him. Again, tempt means to be trapped in an accusation. So a tempt, a temptation is not a desire. A temptation is, is a trap to accuse you. So... They tried to lay a trap in order to accuse Jesus of being against the law of Moses. So that, that's why it says in the law, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. So now they want to have an accuse, they want to accuse him. They want to trap him in an accusation, which is what tempt means. And he says, and I believe the correct understanding of this is that he who is not a participant among you. Let him cast a stone at her. So what do we see down here? And he says, if you make an accusation 
the accusation you're making is telling everybody who you are. So that ties in perfectly to the idea that what he really said was whoever's not a participant. They wanted to accuse her of adultery, and he said, well, then, then that's because you're, you're adulterers. So go ahead. You who wasn't one of the adulterers, go ahead. Cast the first stone. I don't believe for a second that they thought, like, oh, you know, there was that time last week when, when I had that bad thought, or there was that time whenever, and, and that really pricked them to the... No. The reason they walked away was because they were participants. And so he says that whoever makes an accusation is telling you who he is. That's something to think on and, and wrap your mind around that when there's an accusation, the source of that accusation is a lie. And the source of that accusation is that whoever that accuser is, is, is saying, this is who I am. The accuser is announcing his own fault by accusing you of it. And that's what he's saying. Now, this also ties in because he goes back and he says, and this is great because this gets distorted as well. Jesus said, if you continue my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, this isn't saying go out there and find the right doctrine, and if you have the right doctrine, then you won't have to be eternally consciously tormented after you die. It's saying you'll know the truth because the truth will make you free. When you experience liberty, you know what you have is truth. Truth and liberty are inseparable from one another. You will experience liberation, and when you experience liberation, that's truth. So what is the opposite of liberation is accusation. And accusation is a lie, which is how Jesus ties this all together. That if it's accusation, it's a lie. And if it's liberty, it's truth. And that the accusation is telling you about the accuser, not the one accused. So he says, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's word. You therefore hear them not because you are not of God. Why? Not because they're the progeny of a supernatural spirit being rival to God. But because their origin is accusation. And accusation is always a lie. And it's always a lie that tells you about the one making the accusation, not the one being accused. So that's what Jesus is saying. You are of your father, the devil. He's saying your origin is accusation. And so when your source is accusation, the only thing that's going to flow from you is accusation. Just like you have a river and it sources fresh water, and the only thing that flows from it is fresh water. Whatever that source is, that's what, that's what there will be. Whatever kind of tree there is, that's what kind of fruit it will produce. If it's a fig tree, it'll produce figs. If it's a grapevine, it'll produce grapes. Whatever your origin is, whatever your source is, that's what, pro that's what is produced out of you. And so when your source is accusation, the only thing that you can be doing is accusing. And when you're accusing, you're telling people who you are. 